we'll go in for discussion. Over right. to well, uh, thanks for inviting me on this uh, Sunday morning. I just had to rush off because it's raining and I left out a few things outside. Um, so um, I'm, I see we've got quite a good attendance. So it's important that we uh, have an attendance on this subject. As um, you've said, Stan, the, um, my blog is called, has the uh, URL of the next recession. Um, and of course, I've been predicting a recession after the Great Recession of 2008-9, nearly every year since 2015. Um, and of course, if the clock comes round to the midnight and you're predicting it will come to midnight, eventually it comes. However, that's not uh, quite the way we expected this slump to appear. Um, and what I want to do in this uh, presentation is suggest to you that already the world economy was heading towards a recession before we had the virus hit us and the pandemic and then discuss as you say uh, the impact of the pandemic and how long uh, it's going to take if at all for world capitalism particularly the major capitalist economies to recover from this if and when the pandemic subsides and we have some the uh, health systems of the world have some control over it which is still not the case to do that, of course, as is usual with me, I'm now going to present you with a pile of graphs. Um, so assuming that yet yeah, the host is still blocking me, uh, if the host could re release the screen sharer to any, so that I can do that. How's it going, host? <laughs> that often happens because the host controls all. Not yet. As if your host no. goes to screen sharing and says screen sharing for all, we can do it. Yes, we've done it yesterday, so we can do it today. No problem, I believe. Yes, we are away. Here we go. Okay, so that's the subject. What was existed? Uh, what the situation was for the world economy before the pandemic, and during the pandemic, and what's going to be happening afterwards, at least in my view. And I just thought I'd bring you up to date on the state of the impact on the health front of the pandemic. These are the figures from yesterday, which shows on the left-hand graph that uh, we now have deaths per million. Um, in these following countries, these are the top deaths per million by country. Uh, little Belgium has been leading for a very long time uh, because they didn't have control at all at the beginning. Lockdown uh, in, the, in the country, but not in social care and residential homes, which of course has applied virtually to all the health systems, leaving old and sick people in homes to die without any protection. Um, but we can see also across Europe, uh, it's mainly the uh, major European countries that got, have got hit hardest in deaths per million, perhaps not so much in cases. And the UK uh, was leading until they revised the figures last week of the major economies, so Spain slightly ahead. But you can also see a country which claimed that it didn't really need a lockdown and could have a relaxed social distancing environment. Uh, Sweden is virtually up with the, the rest. So that particular approach has not succeeded in controlling the, um, the virus by having just social distancing, a fairly relaxed um, lockdown, uh, as opposed to countries like Spain and Italy, which applied severe lockdowns if late. The UK is high because it was late in applying the lockdown, apart from anything else, and has not been very competent in applying it. But you can see the countries that are coming up from behind during this pandemic, which began, if you like, at the beginning of the year, and for most of Europe began in March, now in the latter part of this first half of the year, uh, the US, Brazil, Mexico are now fast moving up. On the right-hand side of the graph, um, you can see that uh, the excess deaths, that's just as good a measure in many ways uh, of uh, the impact of the COVID virus. Um, we can see that Spain, 
has the highest number percentage excess deaths over the normal average deaths in a year to date, 56% uh, higher this year compared to the last five years average of deaths. And that brings home to you that it's not the case that uh, COVID-19 is just another flu. Um, it's clear that it's much worse and much more deadly than that. It's much more infectious. The incubation period is longer, therefore uh, it's likely to spread more quickly because incubation can take some time. And we now know that it produces a very high number of cases to hospitalization using uh, equipment to try and help people's respiratory system. And even worse, that it now appears that recovery from a severe uh, case of COVID-19 is particularly long, not like a few days in influenza, uh, but can last weeks and months with possible permanent damage. And the death rate is higher. The death rate at the moment is about 3% out of uh, uh, the whole population uh, of cases. Um, actually, it will turn out probably to be under 1% across the world when the, if and when the pandemic ends. But that would be still something like 10 times more than the average influenza death rate, which is about 0.1%. So this is, this is no flu. This is no uh, fuss about nothing. The, the issue, of course, was could it be controlled in a different way? And the answer is yes, in my view. Uh, the first thing to say is that uh, the world governments knew that pandemics were likely. We know that they've been uh, picking up in pace, mainly because of the, the spread of capitalism across the world, fossil fuel exploration, mineral exploration, the timber logging, increasing urbanization, over-industrialization has led, without any controls, has led to human beings getting closer and closer to the wildest parts of the world, where these pathogens have been sitting for thousands of years in wild animals like bats and other animals. And that, we had a crossover of these pathogens through farm animals and industrial farming into the markets, of food markets of the world, and then into human beings. And this is not the first pandemic, and it won't be the last, until something is done about the uncontrolled expansion of capitalist agricultural production in particular, but also mineral and fossil fuel uh, production. Uh, so they knew this, but nothing was done about it. They hoped it would go away. They didn't want to spend any money. And the other thing is that health services have been dramatically reduced in their effectiveness, in their resources and capacity over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, where they have had decent health services in the past, these have been crushed by privatization, by cuts in spending. Health spending has been way below the necessary increase in population, particularly aging population. Governments aren't prepared to spend money on health and on public services, but health in this case. And that's meant that there was just no capacity, no resources, no uh, both human resources in terms of nurses and doctors, but also equipment and protection equipment to deal with a massive influx of sick people into hospitals. So health systems uh, were very quickly going to be overloaded. And so governments were very reluctantly, particularly the capitalist governments, into uh, introducing lockdowns. Uh, they were forced to do so because people stopped, stopped to not go out. Social distancing was taking place voluntarily. So governments were forced into lockdowns to try and control uh, the coronavirus. So uh, when people say, oh, we didn't need a lockdown, which is what they said in Sweden, the truth of the matter is, you did if you didn't have a health service that could protect people and have the resources and particularly now it turns out all people in social care both at home and in residential homes who have been totally neglected in this so that's a brief summary of uh, the situation that brought about the pandemic and i'll just add that the other thing that was not being done for the last 20 years is any attempt to do research into dealing with uh, new viruses with that vaccines and medical uh, treatments. And indeed, uh, of the 19 pharmaceutical companies in the US, only 16, only three out of 60 of the 19 do any research at all in vaccines for wider diseases in the third world. They're much more interested in uh, illnesses that affect rich uh, people in terms of uh, antidepressants and other drugs like that. Not much research at all is being done in protecting people from these pandemic diseases because the, the, there's no profit in it and it was hoped to only kill poor people so it didn't matter. So there was no preparation in, in that area as well. And that shows again how the market has failed completely to handle this situation. 
But let me now talk about uh, the situation in the world economy before the pandemic. So we're talking about before 2019. And I think the first point to make it, in my view, in this short section, is to suggest to you that the world economy was already grinding to a halt and heading into a recession. So it was in a weak position to deal with this uh, pandemic when it hit. In my book, The Long Depression, I present this sort of uh, graphic. And if you look at the uh, top left-hand corner, this is what usually happens in a recession under capitalism, which happens every eight to 10 years in the post-war period. You get a slump, goes down two or three percent, comes back up again, and the trajectory continues. That's what happened in 745, or you can have a double dip as in the 80s. Uh, but those, that's the sort of, you go back to the original trend. Now, I argued in the book, in the Long Depression, that after 2008-9, you didn't go back. Uh, to the previous trend. You came down in the slump, you came back up, but then the trend was much lower. Growth rates after 2008-9 in all the capitalist economies have been much lower than they were before 2008-9. So the actual trajectory of the of economies now is more like a reverse square root, but it is a V-shape which everybody's talking about. And that led me to argue that we were in a sort of long depression. Um, we've had two previous ones which have a similar uh, trajectory. And although this last 10 years, from 2009 up to 2019, has been the longest economic expansion on record without a recession, so uh, Mike Roy's prediction of recessions from 2016 onwards would kept being proved wrong every year as this recession continued, that this expansion continued uh, further and further up to 2019 from the trough year uh, to uh, 2009. But you can also, it's a very long period, but it was also the weakest uh, expansion in the post-war period, not just in the US, but across the capitalist economies. And you can see generally there's a falling away uh, after the Great Recession in particular in, in growth rates across the board in Europe, US, Japan and China. So this was a long expansion, but the weakest ever. Uh, here is a, an example which shows you on the left-hand side the different trajectories you can see that um, there are, there's two trajectories here, that after 2001, you get uh, the pre-2000 trend growth rate for most economies, or this is the US, is the black line. The gray line after 2001 is a lower one. And then after the uh, Great Recession of 2008, uh, we get an even lower trend. And on the right-hand side, you can see that um, the, uh, what has actually happened in this recent period, after the Great Recession, the trend growth rate has dropped dramatically per capita, in this case, uh, to the, and that little grey line shows you the actual uh, growth rates in, compared to the trend before the Great Recession. And then if you can just see vaguely, this Goldman Sachs forecast of where the, where the real GDP per capita in the US will fall to as a result of the pandemic. So we're likely to enter yet a, a new and lower trajectory. And why is this? Well, the main reason is there's been a dramatic drop in investment productively to develop the productive forces, to increase the employment, increase the productivity of labor across the board in the major economies. This is the average OECD economy net productive investment of percentage of GDP. That means uh, there's investment to replace old machinery, factories, and so on, but then there's a little bit extra to expand the economies at a certain growth rate. This is the little bit extra. And you can see that over this past period, there's been a slowdown gradually in the net productive investment rate in the of the OECD economies. And now uh, on the bottom right hand corner, you can see the impact of the pandemic as forecast in 2020 to take that rate uh, way down to the lowest level we've seen probably since uh, before the Second World War. So the world economy, the major economies, are really have been slowing down. Their investment rates have been slowing down. This is even before the pandemic uh, hit us. And why is that? Well, my argument is pr primarily that investment and growth in capitalism depends on making a profit. And if the rate of profit begins to fall, then there will be a slowdown in investment. And if the mass of profit falls, then you will actually have a slump. Here you can see uh, the general trend in the rate of profit in the G20 economies since the end of the Second World War has been down. Not always. Uh, you have the first uh, quarter there, you can see a very high rate of profit relatively to what we have now, uh, the so-called golden age, when there's an expansion of 
of capitalism in the major economies. Then you have the major profitability crisis recorded everywhere. Anybody who looks at the rate of profit will see this uh, result. A dramatic drop in the rate of profit. This is in the G20 economy, so it includes some of the so-called emerging economies as well. Then you have the neoliberal revival from the early 80s up until the end of the last century. And then we've entered a period again of downturn, which has led to a significant uh, slump in 2008-9 and now we've reached a pandemic. So when the pandemic starts, G20 capitalist investment economies were weak because profitability is low. There was no enthusiasm for further and increased investment. That applies particularly to emerging economies, the same sort of trajectory we see, but even a more severe in the latter period of the 21st century, these first 20 years, of the, and that includes China and India in that figure. Uh, the two fastest growing uh, so-called emerging economies are in that figure. And you can still see that the rate of profit has been slipping sharply. And if we look at the US, we look at the mass of profits, we find, uh, we read in the newspapers every day, perhaps we don't read newspapers anymore, uh, we go on the net and we can see that huge profits being made by the so-called fangs, uh, Facebook, Alphabet, Apple, Netflix, Microsoft, etc. Uh, the, these big tech companies are making massive profits. But if you strip out their earnings as on the left-hand side, you can see that the world profits outside of the tech have really been flat for the, since the end of the Great Recession. So profits, not just the profitability, but the mass of profits are do, is doing nothing for the great swathe of companies across the world if you take the tech sector out. That applies to Europe on the right-hand side just as much as it does to the US. And what we have now is something like 20% of companies uh, in the major economies, usually small ones, where such is the low level of their profits and profitability that they can hardly cover the interest and debt servicing costs that they have on the debt that they've built up. So basically these companies employ their workforce, they pay their interest on the, and the other debt repayments, and they have really nothing left to increase and expand the uh, company at all in, in any way. So 20% of companies in that position before the pandemic, we call them the zombie companies, the living dead, they're still there, but they're not doing anything in terms of developing the productive forces, employing more people, investing higher at all. They're just hanging in there. And mainly smaller companies, not entirely, but they've, that's reached a high level, as you can see, over the past uh, 20 or 30 years, particularly after the Great Recession. So another example of the weakness of the world economy. And part of the reason for the fact that these companies can't uh, grow is there's been rising corporate debt. With low profitability, low investment, and relatively low growth, these companies have been forced to expand uh, borrowing in order to keep going because they're not, so it's like that. They get, take out more debt in order to grow and therefore they, they make it more difficult for themselves to repay that debt so they have to take out more debt. So we've seen generally across the board a sharp increase in corporate debt in the non-financial sector uh, and that applies across the world both in mature markets, the red line here, and in the top uh, developing economies, the light blue line there, particularly there you see an increase uh, in the past uh, 20 years and particularly again after the end of the Great Recession. So we've got weak profits, weak investment, weak growth and rising debt. That's a combination for a slump uh, that was going to happen. And here's just a figure which shows the productivity of that debt. More debt, less productive increases, so that the debt to productivity has been dropping sharply over the past uh, 20 or 30 years uh, in all the major economies, and that trend is still downward. So you could say that capitalism has got weaker and weaker in the period since the late 1990s, really, and uh, the Great Recession, as you can see, a big slump there, uh, but that uh, figure has continued to, to go into trend decline as we reach 2019 uh, and enter the period of the pandemic. And perhaps one of the most uh, startling things that we've seen since the end of the Great Recession is the com complete slowdown in world trade. If you've got an economy which depends upon exports in order to grow, because you don't really have a big market uh, at home, you're not a China, you're not an India, you're not the United States, you're more like a Germany or a Sweden or a, a commodity economy like Brazil or um, uh, all the mineral and export and agricultural company economies, those depend on an expanding world trade in order to maintain and improve. 
And you can see average growth rates in the world trade was just under 6% before the Great Recession, which was faster than global growth. Global growth, even in nominal terms, was slightly less than that. So uh, trade was a way out for, for countries that weren't growing fast enough domestically. But since the end of the Great Recession, that growth rate has dropped to just 2% before we got to the pandemic. So trade has slowed down dramatically as a result of all the other measures we just talked about. And you could talk about the end of globalization. You can see that after 2008 9 there's a complete flattening out of the general level of uh, exports and imports as a percentage of world GDP. Globalization, the great period of the uh, 1980s, 1990s, and onwards has come uh, sharply to an end in the period since the Great Recession. Another factor adding towards the weakness of the world economy before this pandemic. So, on this point, you see that when we got to the end of 2019, Michael Ops is finally feeling confident that he's going to be proved right and that there would be a new uh, global recession with corporate profits growth. That's the mass of profits, not the rate of profits, but the whole uh, profits in the corporate sector of six different major economies uh, that had ground to a complete halt uh, in 2019 before we got to the pand pandemic. And you can see, we can discuss further, you can see the ups and downs of that growth rate is an indication of the way the world economy goes. It's a very good measure. But by 2019, we were really uh, deeply into that uh, likelihood of a new global recession. After me predicting it in 2016, you can see it was, might have been right, but it didn't happen. Um, we, we can, that's another matter, uh, debate. Um, we have a situation where the world economy was heading into a slump. So then we get the lockdown. We discussed why that uh, was necessary on the part of capitalist governments who didn't want to do it. Uh, but this graph, which is a bit complicated, boils down to this, that the shock of the pandemic and the virus uh, hitting the world is really takes three parts. First of all, it takes a supply shock. Everything gets closed down in the lockdown, production stops, workers are sent home or furloughed or whatever, uh, people are working at home. So there's a huge supply shock. The second thing is a demand shock because now people are earning less income, so at least a sizable section of the population of the working population is not the better off. They still being actually increase their uh, net incomes because they don't, they're still getting paid and they don't spend. Uh, that's the point. They don't spend, and it's also workers who've got reduced incomes don't spend. So we have a huge demand shock. So consumption collapses, uh, particularly as we know in the service sector, leisure, entertainment, all these areas, travel, tourism have been decimated. Um, so the demand hit there has been huge upon them, uh, unprecedented on the world economy. Uh, what we haven't had yet is the third aspect, which is the financial crash. And that is, unlike the Great Recession of 2008-9, which appeared to be triggered by a financial crash, this time, uh, although it always starts with supply, this time the financial crash seems to be at the end of the uh, dangers in the pandemic impact. And we'll see, we could discuss that further. Uh, but what the pandemic showed was a global economy already on the cliff edge, then collapsed into a great chasm and dropped dramatically in terms of the relative strength of economies around the world. And this is the unprecedented thing, something like 93% at the beginning, uh, during the pandemic of economies are now uh, in recession. 93% of all the world's economies are in recession. You've never seen that figure, not even in the Great Recession of 2009, or even in the 1930s Depression. That is how severe this pandemic is. The argument is it's only going to be short term, unlike the Great Recession of the 30s, um, or perhaps even the Great Recession of 2008-9, which lasted eight, 18 months. Well, we'll see. But this is nevertheless the biggest fall that uh, the world economy has suffered ever really, or since records began, certainly back to 1871 on this uh, graph. Uh, unemployment employment has fallen by anything between uh, 50 to 15 uh, percent, depending on the economy. But that's a dramatic drop in just uh, a couple of quarters, particularly in March and April. These figures, um, you can see that a significant decline in employment is really damaging uh, to people's incomes, prospects, and so on, and their livelihoods. Naturally, as we can discuss, there has been attempts by governments to support. Uh, uh, workers made unemployed or furloughed or losing their uh, incomes uh, and small businesses too, but has that been sufficient? In the US, for example, we have something like over 30 million uh, 
work, American workers now unemployed, <coughs> making unemployment claims. They were getting subsidized to £600 a month by Congress, but that stopped during this month, and there's still no new deal in place. So all these uh, unemployment claimants are now just living on the basic unemployment rate that the different states in the US offer. And that you can see the dramatic increase from just 3 million uh, earlier on in the year to the levels that we have now, with little sign that this is falling much. It's falling a little, but not very much. And perhaps even worse, in emerging, so-called emerging markets, the developing economies, the peripheral economies uh, exploited by imperialism, for the first time, if we measure all the major economies, that includes China and India, there is now a slump in these developing economies. Even in the Great Recession of 2009, there wasn't uh, a negative figure because it included China, India, and a few countries that still continued to grow. But this time is different. So instead of growing at 5% or so, 4 or 5% or so each year without fail, despite slumps uh, uh, in the rest of the advanced economies, this time the emerging world is in a serious slump. Um, in the US, there uh, we see the dramatic difference we, now between what is happening to the top 1% of the population and the rest. The, uh, the huge injection of credit and money by the Federal Reserve has not led particularly to helping people unemployed or even small businesses taking out loans who are staggering on. But what it has led to is a dramatic rise in the stock market after the shock of the pandemic hitting and the slump, then the pumping in of money to purchase government bonds, corporate bonds, and generally provide sufficient liquidity for uh, companies to speculate in the stock market and buy their own shares back, which is what the big companies are doing with the help of the Federal Reserve, we see the stock markets hitting new highs rather than uh, slumping as a result so far. Whether that will continue is another matter. But who's benefiting out of the pandemic so far is quite clearly the top 1%. There's been a huge fiscal spend in the, uh, so the governments have been spending and through great packages to try and support basically big business. Two thirds of the fiscal spend in the US, which is around uh, 10%, eight to 10% of GDP, unprecedented amount. Uh, two thirds of that's gone to big business, to the big airlines, big other companies who have uh, been cl virtually closed down. Uh, a small bit to the small businesses and a tiny bit to households across the board and hardly anything to local and state governments, which are ha also continue to have to provide uh, services. They're in serious trouble. But these fiscal packages across the board in the world are huge. Uh, in the Great Recession, the fiscal packages on average were about, uh, for the world, were about 2% of, or 3% of world GDP. We're talking 4, 5, or even 6% of GDP as a result of that. And what that means, of course, is these unprecedented deficits uh, building up across the board for and this is the global deficit now, about $30 trillion worth or 30% of global GDP, governments are spending more than they're getting in revenues at the moment. That's a dramatic increase in the amount in order to support the, uh, the economy in its various areas, but also means that governments are taking on huge amounts of debt because this is all through borrowing. So <clears throat> already public sector debt had, was rising since the Great Recession, hadn't really been reduced very much, and uh, now that we're talking about a figure before the pandemic of around about global public debt, at least in the advanced countries being around about 100%, now heading towards 130 or 140% of GDP before this pandemic is over. And emerging market economies, uh, which haven't been able to afford such a level of borrowing, uh, are also increasing. So this is a huge amount of debt. Can this just be continually uh, allowed to expand or does it, do, do, the, do capitalism have to do something about this? because this is bound to eventually squeeze the, the private sector. And how would it do that? Because the debt servicing costs, first of all, for the governments are going to increase. So interest rates are really very, very low, if not zero. Uh, governments are borrowing at very historically low rates. But if you keep borrowing even more, the total amount of interest relative to the tax revenues you're getting will rise because you're just increasing the amount of debt. So uh, we're going heading to 10% of the budget uh, tax revenues that com uh, governments have got is just going covering interest on the borrowing they've made to the owners of this debt. 
uh, which of course will be the banks and other financial institutions and the big companies. So uh, if you're running a budget over the next five years for a government, 10% of your money just taken away completely from the tax revenues because you're just covering the interest and that will continue to rise over the next few years, reducing your ability to provide any extra public services and so on. Uh, but as I said, the financial sector is the real danger here. But we haven't had the, the uh, financial crash yet. But if companies can't, companies are going bust across the board now uh, in the major uh, advanced economies. They're not going to come back, mainly small companies, but some big ones. If those companies go bust, they will default on their debts. That's good. That bankruptcies will increase the pressure on banks who will have a lot of um, bad debts that they will not get money for, not be serviced. Uh, it's estimated now that about $130 billion has been provided in banks' uh, budgets for next year uh, on, on the expectation of these levels of debt default and loan defaults, which they expect. US bankruptcies are on the rise, they're back to levels they've not been seen before in numbers. The value as yet is not very high because it's mainly small companies, but as we go into 2021, I suspect that this is the next stage of the pandemic slump, and that we begin to see bankruptcies across the board, and then banks facing severe difficulties in trying to uh, uh, deal with the impact of those uh, debt levels. So that final section on after the pandemic, what I call the scarring. Uh, this is a trendy word that some economists are using to say a bit like health situation, that the COVID uh, can, uh, if you get the uh, virus and you get it badly, it can scar your lungs and other organs indefinitely. And in some way, and that will make it very difficult for you to recover if at all. You could argue the same for the economy, that if it's such severe and such widespread slump uh, with a hit to whole ranges of companies in terms of their finances uh, and also uh, the loss of huge loss of jobs for particularly uh, those people who are of the lowest levels of the wage ladder, these are the people who are getting hit the most, uh, you can have a permanent scarring of the economy. There's no recovery because the whole thing is disrupted, both international trade, value chains, and also uh, employment and investment uh, for the major economies. And if the severity and the spread of this stump could cause what you might call permanent scarring. Already, incomes will be permanently lost. If you look at that uh, blue shadow area, that tells you uh, where the loss of income, permanent cumulative output loss that will take place over the next year or two, according to the International Monetary Fund, something like $12.5 trillion in lost output, well, which otherwise would have been uh, produced if there hadn't been slumps. So the trajectory would have continued on that top line, uh, but because we have the slump, we go down to this figure well below the original uh, point at the, at the beginning of 2019. Recovery is relatively poor, so there's a cumulative loss. So that could get even bigger if that bottom blue line does not return to the top line, which is most likely. So there are very good reasons to expect no V-shaped recovery, which is what uh, the leaders of the US administration and finance hope for, and what the Bank of England said was going to happen uh, in, the, in April, they've changed their view now. But you've got 90% of the world economy is contracting, so there's a synchronized slump, and that's, that just means that any, any country that starts to recover, say like China, is gonna recover very slowly because it can't export as much as it did before when the rest of the world is still in slump. Uh, and that's the problem that uh, even the recovering countries have got. Uh, they can rely on perhaps on the home market to some extent if things are improving there, but trade, if that's what they depend on, will not be there to, to compensate. So this major slump in world trade it is reducing the ability of uh, all countries to come out of this slump, even if the pandemic comes to an end. And as I say, with productive investment and profitability at all times lows, then it's very difficult to see uh, capitalist companies uh, sprinting forward uh, as uh, the lockdowns end. Um, so we've had the, one of the worst yearly, yearly declines in the last century. And that, as I say, is a scarring damage upon the economies themselves. And yet, and also as they come out, a huge increase in debt levels, both corporate debt and public sector debt, is gonna put huge 
burden upon uh, governments and corporations to repay this debt to the owners of debt. It's not going to be cancelled, particularly in emerging economies who face huge amounts of uh, debt that they have to repay to the imperialist uh, companies and uh, financial institutions who have uh, provided that debt. And this means that there's no resources available to invest uh, and produce productively. And of course, there's no end to the pandemic yet. This is the very latest figures. I just got them, cumulative number of deaths. Uh, uh, you can see right up now, and you can see that the green line tells you that uh, the United States is racing up with the number of deaths. Um, so is Brazil, so is India. Uh, we've got three countries, maybe four, if you include Iran and some others, who are not declining in the number of deaths. Europe's flattened out, but only flattened out. It hasn't actually uh, declined dramatically yet. So the cumulative number of deaths is significantly increasing still, and that's deaths. Cases is way, way worse because the death rate has been falling in countries which are mainly younger in their population. And there's this trade calamity which I talked about. I can't see that changing much. Here's the estimate of the World Trade Organization, which sees the trajectory for trade growth disappearing and successively lower levels of trajectory until here in 2020 is going to be even lower uh, or not, even on an optimist, optimistic or pessimistic scenario. So this, this scarring suggests that we're going to, without a high growth rebound to the initial trend, recessions can cause permanent economic scarring, says the IMF, and you can see the graphs on the right suggest, again, this failure to return to the initial trend line and it continue on a much lower trajectory, which means across the board, employment, incomes, investment, all the things that matter in, in getting uh, people's better, a better living standard, leaving aside all the other issues, which I'm briefly going to deal with now, um, is not going to happen very easily, if at all, over the next five years as a result of this pandemic. Let me give you a theoretical position. Um, Joseph Schumpeter, the uh, Austrian economist, said that the input was creative destruction. Stunts were necessary to capitalism because they kill off inefficient firms and allow smaller, innovative firms to then take over and take uh, the capitalist economy forward. So cycles are necessary. They are a creative process under capitalism. Well, thanks very much, uh, Joseph, uh, for the rest of us while we're in the slump. But even so, does that argument uh, hold in this case? Marx said, slightly differently, the slumps kill off the weak and inefficient, allowing the more efficient and more profitable uh, to uh, take their place and actually grow and consolidate and concentrate and centralize uh, capital. Um, what are we having at the moment? Well, at the moment, actually, possibly neither. With central banks buying all the corporate bonds, uh, supporting the uh, big companies, uh, lots of companies, all those zombie companies, are still surviving. We'll see if they'll survive much longer, but they have been up to now. Quite likely, we could end up position. If we come out of the pandemic slump in 2021, say that there hasn't really been a, a creative destruction that created an environment for higher profitability and for a faster investment. We're going to be locked into a period of further, another leg of this long depression I talked about. So uh, it, it, I suggest to you that perhaps we're going to enter a period that's not the opposite of Sean Payton's creative destruction and not even Marx's view of that traditional classical uh, cycle of boom and slump that he referred to as being the result of capitalism. Um, so we end up with this reverse square root, as I talk about uh, here. You can see here's the OECD's view. Everybody's got the reverse square root now as a possible uh, scenario. And the OECD has one here. With a, if you have a second wave, which they call a double hit scenario, and it seems we're just about entering the second wave possibly in Europe. Uh, uh, first wave is still off elsewhere in the Americas, but a second wave in Europe is now being talked about. We could be on that bottom dotted red line now as a scenario going through the next uh, uh, year or so. I'll finish on this point, Chair. Uh, Antonio Guterres is the UN Jet Secretary General, and uh, last uh, month he made a speech where he said the world economy was at breaking point. And what he said was really quite staggering for the head of the UN. He said, uh, we're, this, reveal, this uh, pandemic is revealing, he says, uh, all the things that are wrong 
with the capitalist economy, revealing the fractures and the fragile skeleton of the societies we have built. This is exposing fallacies and falsehoods everywhere. The first falsehood, the lie that free markets can deliver health care for all. So Anthony Vigoris says that the markets failed on the health front. Market health care can't work. That's what the UN Secretary General says. He says it's a fiction that unpaid care work is not work. And that's one of the things we've learned from the pandemic some that people who have been looking after the old and sick um, have been completely uh, left to their own devices and that the most important people in, in this pandemic have been the frontline workers, the carers and so on. They're the worst paid, the worst uh, uh, appreciated in society, while uh, jobs that don't matter at all in society, like hedge fund managers, marketing managers, management consultants, economists, none of these people are any use at all during the pandemic. What's been proved is that the people who matter are the people who pay the least, the people who don't matter are unproductive and paid the most and have suffered the least out of this pandemic. And that's a, the fiction that they, these people don't matter is what Andrew Gorris has pointed out. And a delusion that we live in a post-racist world. Well, yes, we know all about that uh, from what we've seen uh, in the course of the last uh, few months with Black Lives Matter, uh, police racism in the US and hundreds of other examples of that nature. But here's the UN General Secretary General agreeing with that. And the myth, he says, that we're all in the same boat. Well, yes, exactly. That's uh, how we have learned from this pandemic economy that the, what the UN General Secretary is telling us. So what does he conclude? It's time for global leaders to, are we going to succumb to chaos, division, inequality? Or we, will we right the wrongs of the past and move forward together for the good of all? Well, it's, an, it's a brave... Uh, uh, demand or claim or hope, but it's just hope because there's been no international cooperation on COVID, quite the reverse, as we've seen with the role of the US and China. And there's no international cooperation on vaccine. It's a competition to see who can come with a vaccine first and flog it to everybody else. It's been an absolute scandal of the level of uh, lack of cooperation, both internationally and within the country, of course. And all the problems that existed before the pandemic remain, and that, if they're going to be worse. The left-hand graph here shows the rise in uh, the inequality in the United States, what the top 1% have as a percentage of uh, incomes. And that continues to rise dramatically and will continue after this. Then we have an increase in poverty from the Elston, the UN Special Rapporteur recently reported when he retired, that even before the pandemic, 3.4 billion people, half the world, lived on less than $5.50 a day. And that number has barely declined since 1990. And I point out that if you strip, the China has taken 800 million people out of poverty on that level in that period since 1990. So if you strip them out, you can see the dramatic failure to reduce poverty on the part of any other country in the world, including India which has miserably failed as well. And that can only get worse after this pandemic. And of course, what's being done about global warming and climate change? Absolutely nothing. The US has withdrawn from the Paris Agreement, pathetic as that was, and there's been no attempt to control fossil fuel production at all. Uh, luckily, the pandemic has reduced travel and tourism, so uh, carbon emissions have been falling in 2020. But that will change, of course, as the uh, relaxation of the lockdown takes place. And it's clear now, according to the latest research, that within the next five years, we're going to go over the annual global temperature increase that will cause severe problems worldwide. Environmental destruction continues. Nothing has changed. The Amazon forests are burning. Uh, logging continues in Brazil at massive proportions and in India and elsewhere. The environmental destruction continues, increasing the likelihood of more frequent and more deadly pandemics over the next few years. So if we go in to 2021 and beyond, even if these lockdowns come to an end, with nothing being done on the part of capitalism to sort out the major challenges that, which humanity faces over the next uh, uh, few years and longer. That is it. Okay, thanks, uh, Michael.
very optimistic. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got um, and some, somebody asking a question, can we share your uh, PowerPoint presentation? I think that'd be very useful for comrades. Maybe we, maybe we can find a way to put that on the uh, communistuniversity.uk website along with the videos and uh, reports of conference. Uh, Wait, am I mute? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Uh, just a moment, uh, Mehdi. It's Mehdi, is it? No. no. Can you hear me? Yes, but hold on a moment. Uh, well, no. I just want to say I can put the, my uh, slides on the PDF and I'll send them to you. And I'll put them on my Facebook site. Too. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, sorry, I was confused there as to who was <laughs> speaking. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, I, yes, a couple of other, Well, we've got scarring of the economy. We've got synchronised slump. And, and a, a UN general secretary who appears to be a kind of communist. <laughs> <laughs> Some hopes. Um, so uh, questions now. Comrades can indicate in chat or they can use the, light, the uh, blue hand. I'll just explain the blue hand method. If you click on participants at the bottom of your screen, then you get a, a not only you get the chat, but you get a, light, a little horizontal menu which says invite mute me and raise hand uh, that's where you can raise your blue hand to speak okay and that brings you up to the top of the list there but you can also say in uh, in chat uh, i wish to speak so the first speaker i've got is uh, john smithy followed by Mehdi mir hello can you hear me yes john go ahead um shall uh says that 230,000 families are at immediate risk of uh, eviction due to non-payment of rent during the lockdown. At the same time, there's two and a half million people have, uh, are buy-to-let landlords. Also, in London, rents have fallen by 8% since February, and letting agents in London are have three times as many properties on their books as uh, a, a year ago. I'd like to ask uh, Michael, are we about to see an implosion of the buy to let market? And we, could we see hundreds of thousands of uh, buy to let landlords going bust? Where I live in Wispage in Cambridgeshire, most of the Tory party activists and Tory councillors are buy-to-let landlords. One Tory councillor told me he's got £100,000 of buy-to-let debt. Also, in 2005, The Economist and Warwick University Business School predicted a collapse in house prices, but for various reasons it didn't happen. Is it possible that we will see mass evictions and mass homelessness at the same time as a lot of empty properties? And also, with rents falling, could we see a knock-on effect in falling house prices? My second part I'd like to say is about your book, uh, Marx 200, where you write about the effects of automation and robots, I can, I'll get the impression from your book that under capitalism, we are not going to see a mass introduction of automation and robots because the rate of profit would fall to zero. And before that happened, you would have a uh, downturn in the economy. Also, the UK being a low wage economy means that it's cheap to employ migrant labor and invest in new technology. This is what happens in factories in Finland, that rather than invest in new technology, they just have migrant workers on low wages. Finally, in your book, Marx 200, you say that there's gonna be a shift in from manual labor to mental labor. In Cambridge, in the county where I live, Cambridgeshire, there is enormous demand for graduates with degrees and PhDs 
in biochemistry from employers in researching into cancer and Alzheimer's, that sort of thing. Is this what you mean by a shift to mental labour? Thank you for your, I'll leave it there. Okay, I've got a couple of speakers, but I'll just read, I'll read for those who can't see the small print in the chat, um, the three questions from Mehdi Mir. Uh, and uh, you can come back on it, Michael, when you come to speak, okay? So question one, how do we, how do you make a link between capitalist exp expansion, e.g. use of fossil fuel and pandemics? Okay. Number two is why the profitability of tech companies such as Facebook has been rising while an industry where real production takes place has been falling. And the third one, what do you mean by end of globalization? There you are. Um, so I'll let this hang for a minute. It's for you um, or anybody actually, but for you, Michael, those questions. Uh, Alan Gibson followed by Jim Cook. Alan. Uh, yeah, thanks for that uh, introduction, Michael. Uh, your usual cheery prognosis. <laughs> um, I'd actually say, like to say, that I think that picking up on something you mentioned at the beginning and at the end, that the prognosis is probably even worse uh, than you predict, uh, and that's to do with the question of climate change and generalised ecological collapse. Um, because I don't think that, um, because uh, I think your fourth point in your summary slide was talking about that, um, the, the discussions about the destruction of wealth and income and how much time that will take to repair. Um, and so the uh, question of a uh, one or two waves of the pandemic affecting the um, lockdown in terms of what that's done to the economy. Um, but I don't think the pandemic can be seen in isolation. As you mentioned at the beginning, um, pandemics um, of this zoonosis form, that is the transfer of viruses uh, between animal species, is something that is uh, going to be part of the new normal, um, assuming that there is not a massive change to the nature of agricultural production and the industrialized and monocultural form that it takes in um, capitalism in the world today. But that but that's even it's even worse than that because if you just look at agriculture, the uh, danger of extreme weather events um, which are increasing as we all know um, and are going to keep on increasing as climate change, which is actually climate chaos increases, um, is posing the threat of a collapse of not just um, specific areas of agricultural production, but a number of the areas of agricultural production, um, which could cause not just increase in fruit prices, which are likely to occur as a result of all the effects of ecological collapse, but a major collapse in uh, food production um, around the world. But looking at other issues, I mean, another big one which is going to affect um, capitalism in the medium, short to medium term is sea level rises. You can already see this in some American cities like uh, Miami and other cities in Florida, which now suffer regular flooding. And we've hardly had any uh, impact of the rising sea levels, which are, are going to be occurring from the increasing ice melt, um, particularly if the current research um, which is looking at the threat of a um, ice melt in the Antarctica, the big ice shelves there where the big uh, ice end exists. If that occurs, then you have a major problem because I, know, I live in Cork and Ireland and Cork's not going to survive. We already have flooding now, let alone with uh, sea level rises of metres, uh, which is coming in the next 20 to 50 years depending on exactly how quickly things occur. Um, and, and as well as in terms of um, health and the 
disruption to um, society and production that that's going to cause. It's not just a question of pandemics, but there's also the question of the migration of disease bearing um, pests. Um, I'm one of the ones that capitalism is particularly concerned about is obviously mosquito spread and all the diseases that go with that, but there are any number if you delve into this and it's a particularly scary area to be spending too much time researching, but the spread of those diseases um, to major populations and particularly into the imperialist heartlands is going to cause major disruption to international capital. Um, something that uh, I'd be interested in knowing what you think about is the threat to international trade and the way that international capital has um, built up these very sophisticated, shall we say, supply chains where you any product goes backward and forwards between countries and you have all these, you have uh, individual components created in different places. And so one threat to that is um, the, in an immediate sense, is the um, disruption of international travel, um, which is a necessary component of that trade. But thinking a little bit further ahead, the problem of um, fossil fuels and the, the need to do something about that, which capitalism is kind of recognizing, but the problem is that you can't make, and it, there's no signs yet of being able to make planes fly off electrical batteries. Um, and also the con massive container ships which move these products backwards and forwards all over the world and the uh, effect they have on global warming. I mean, on you talking about problems of globalization, do you see that as a significant component in that as capitalism has to deal with the, uh, I don't know if it's a scissors, but the problem of that large component of um, greenhouse gas production being so closely tried, tied to trade and those very strange supply chains which have been built up by international capital. Um, and you can go on and on, there's just the, the, what's going to happen in terms of human migration as you get wet bulb events becoming an actual reality, a uh, wet bulb being when the level of temperature and humidity rises to such a level um, that human beings die. Um, that those events, uh, they're even talking about those events starting to occur in uh, Europe, let alone the uh, very, the areas around the equator which are gonna suffer from uh, much more extreme increase and regular increases in uh, temperature. Um, so the questions of migration and what that does to the, um, particularly the, the way that the production is now tending to be centred in a lot of those areas, particularly in Asia, and that it's going to be increasingly difficult for people to uh, survive, let alone produce in the way that they produce now um, in those areas. Finish. Thank you, Alan. Actually, uh, one more point, actually. Uh, and yesterday there was a, a comment made about uh, the relevance of um, the method of the transitional program um, and the linking of um, immediate demands to demands which pose the overthrow of capital. And I think it was Jim Cregan was talking about how the, a lot of the time when uh, people have been raising the transitional program. It wasn't really equivalent to the time it had been posed because the crisis was clear. We're heading to world war. Uh, the oppression had just occurred. But um, this isn't quite on the topic. But I think that there is a, to the extent that that is an argument that perhaps it, the method of transitional program hasn't had as much traction as it did in the past. Period was because we weren't in that same level of crisis. But it seems to me that we're now entering a period of, some people use the term existential crisis, but certainly a massive crisis because of the situation of ecological collapse and that method of the transitional program is becoming more and more relevant. relevant. Actual finish. Yes, thanks, Alan. No, that's, uh, it's very relevant. And the, the idea of continuing discussion through the different sessions is, uh, is 
quite okay. In fact, a good idea. Um, we don't want to be in, uh, what do you call it, silos, do we? Uh, Michael, we've, I've got plenty. I've got three more speakers here. I hope you're coping with the answers and uh, you can insist on coming in if you want to. Um, That's fine so far. Do you want me to come in now or do you want me to wait? I've got, I've got three, three to come and then you, okay. I, think, I suggest, yeah? Okay, uh, Jim Cook, then Simon, and then Mike McNair. Jim. Hello, and as others have said, thanks for making our Sunday morning. Uh, uh, the last speaker mentioned what you were talking about uh, as well, the, the climate change. Uh, in this country, of course, the politicians were saying all the time we, we are following the science and uh, dealing with the pandemic and so on. They were lying, but as you say, there's nothing being done about climate change. I'm not aware of any country in the world which has got anything uh, useful uh, to do about that. And of course, one of the things that uh, is presumably already happening and we don't really hear much about is famine. Uh, and there's a plague of locusts, uh, which was in the news a few weeks ago, but I haven't seen anything of, of it since. I think we're going to get a lot more of that. But the, the question I was originally thinking of was, with the deindustrialization of uh, countries like Britain and the United States and so on, of course, uh, one of the things that, that have been people have tried to fill the gap with is tourism. Uh, in South Wales, in Northeast England, in Detroit, all over the place, people try tourism to, uh, to, to get people to spend money back in these uh, Rust Belt towns. Uh, and of course, what's been hit hardest in the pandemic, perhaps, is uh, hospitality, tourism, and consumerism. Uh, all ways that uh, have been trying to fill the sort of hole in the richer countries over the last few decades and presumably even the IT companies will be hit by the hit on consumerism because if you haven't got people spending money then you haven't got pe people advertising uh, on their platforms so that the the idea of, uh, of a recovery in the in the next year or two and I, don't, and I think you've been uh, pretty clear that that's pretty optimistic anyway, is uh, dubious to say the least. That's it. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, Simon? <clears throat> yeah, I just want to um, point out that, yeah, one thing that I think John Smithy just mentioned that you didn't mention in your talk was the uh, role of technology. Um, which I think John just alluded that you did say you did mention it in the book in the book but obviously you know you've got things like 4D printing you've got the internet of things you've got the rollouts of 5G robotics um, all those sorts of things which may uh, you know lessen the need for workers you know workers or labor could literally be eviscerated and we could get to a situation where we could be working 20 hours a week um, if this uh, sort of furlough scheme does actually convert to what was um, discussed prior to the uh, pandemic and the lockdown as the universal basic income. Well, obviously, you'd only use the basic uni universal basic income at, I guess, uh, government approved shops. You know, you couldn't go out and buy it and get to take, you know, go down to the local pub and buy 10 pints of beer. You know, you'd have, probably have to account for how you spent that money. But, um, you know, it's, it just goes to show that I think you just uh, sort of mentioned it in terms of the, the, the banks and the Federal Reserve who actually print the money and are buying up this debt. And there's got to, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of one big Ponzi scheme at the end of the day. Money goes from the top down, 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 just filters down to those companies who need them. But what, what, as you said, they're just doing share buybacks to increase the share price just to make their company look good. But those companies are actually being hollowed out, and they, at the end of the day, they're just, they're just, it's just sort of manage, uh, perception management. So um, there must come a time when those banks feel that you know it's just not worth. Uh, well, you know, that there's got to be a tipping point when they're not going to get a return on their debts. Um, 
Yeah, just one thing in terms of climate, because uh, you, you haven't mentioned food. Food prices are going up um, at the moment, and uh, there's been sort of um, harvests are failing. I know in the UK, you know, harvests are going down by about 20%. And then you've got the changing patterns of where food is grown. Um, Jim mentioned locusts. Locusts are attracted to growing areas of vegetation and parts of where locusts have been appearing is in Africa, the Sahel region, and the Middle East and Yemen, which are, are going to be the new sort of uh, food baskets of the world, while the UK, you know, reproduction, all those sorts of things will go down. So there'll be a new fight, I think, in Africa and the Sahel region for food. So um, when you, and just uh, going back to the beginning of the talk, when you started talking, I was thinking zombie companies, you know, this, this actual, the, uh, pandemic and sort of 90% of companies which are or organizations which or countries which are in um, recession I said you know it'll get rid of the zombie companies but you're saying that uh, Schumpter and Marx you know it's not working out as how they sort of might <laughs> predict it so um, you know it so what's going to happen next I guess is the answer <laughs> so anyway thanks Yes, okay. The thing is, uh, concentration of capital happens, doesn't it? So the lots of cases die off and other business eat them up. Um, it's now Mike McNair and then going back to Michael uh, Roberts after Mike, Mike McNair. Okay. Michael, Mike McNair, go ahead. Okay. Um, Michael, I have a series of picks uh, about particular issues of which, but some of, a couple of issues of substance. I also want to respond to Alan. Um, Belgium has the highest rate, but actually that's because Belgium's uh, deaths per million is an excess deaths figure, not a, uh, a, a deaths from COVID figure. They've just reported from the outset, reported all excess deaths. Yeah. As, uh, as, as their deaths per million figure, with the result that Belgium had this sort of weird uh, also excessively high figure for deaths per infections because they didn't have that high a rate of infections in, from the point of view of their, uh, that. Um, I guess supported, but I, you may be able to explain this. I was looking for figures for um, UK balance of trade and it turned out that in Q4, 2019 suddenly the UK balance of trade was favorable in goods mm -hmm. which hasn't been the case for decades and then the explanation in the uh, trade figures site uh, in the spring was that that was due to a collapse in imports of machinery which I guess is an example of your that the uh, collapse in profitable in productive investment is takes the form in the UK of collapse in investment in machinery, which gives a bizarre effect of uh, that the, the, the balance of trade seems to shift in the UK's favour, in fact, because the economy is declining. Um, I, it would be helpful for you to give some explanation of why you've been predicting <laughs> uh, uh, it, it is uh, it's a notorious feature of Marxist to have what it predicted seven of the last three recessions uh, but then the question is it fairly clearly it's a time scale problem or a, a, a chaos problem one or the other related to the two things that there's something uh, but is it also to do with the fact that we've had QE and artificial depression of interest rates persistently through and also arm twisting, in particular, uh, that the government twisted the arms of the banks and building societies not to foreclose on uh, borrowers. Um, so that we've had, uh, it's notorious in the people who teach the subject I teach, land law, uh, that uh, instead of having had a house price crash and a whole lot of people in negative equity as we had in the early 90s. We have instead large numbers of zombie borrowers who aren't actually able to uh, pay their full uh, mortgage interest, uh, whether it's buy to let, as John was talking about, or uh, actually ordinary borrowing. Uh, but the because the government twisted the arms of the banks and building societies to keep them afloat, um, that they're, they're still there. Um, Uh, 
Schumpeter Peter and Marx and creative discussion. I'm not sure that I believe Marx either any more than Schumpeter in relation to creative discussion, because it seems to me that actually when a real crash happens, uh, what happens is uh, simply centralization of the uh, 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 centralization of the economy in favor of groups of people who either happen to be sitting on piles of cash uh, an immediate access to liquidity or have good crony relations with government which allows the government to, means that the government will help them out in one way or another where they won't help out uh, other people which I think fairly clearly that's one of the things which is going on in this crisis is that there are some there is selective some firms are going to the wall others are being helped out by HMG in particular that the retail sector is being allowed to uh, collapse um, but uh, the uh, 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 IT guys are being uh, promoted and this is the wave of the future um, so those are all as it were picks uh, point of substance pandemics and close to nature now hey think about what the world was like uh, before capitalism you know, with the large majority of the population living in the countryside uh, with animals. Um, as, you, know, you can see the damn longhouses. You go to the, the Wales, there are places where the, the, there was a, a accommodation for the humans at one end of the building and accommodation for animals at the other end of the building. And then at the same time, uh, the evidence of pandemics, the Antonine Plague, which is probably thought to have been measles in the late second century AD, the Justinianic Plague, which is almost certainly bubonic plague in the 530s, 540s, which spread along the lines of the uh, international trade routes connected with the Byzantine Empire, the Black Death, the recurrences of the Black Death through to the um, end of the Little Ice Age in the uh, um, uh, uh, 1660s um, blah blah and of course the influenza pandemic after the uh, First World War it, it, I, I think it's a it's a piece of green ideology that says capitalism increases the frequency of uh, pandemics due to us being in contact more contact with remote parts of nature and, uh, and spread of yes certainly there are going to be Viruses, but the truth is that diseases co-evolve with humans, and we nor and, and pandemics are a normal feature of the human condition. What capitalism has done to us is the stuff which you really usefully described about um, uh, uh, just in time and uh, efficiency gains and uh, public expenditure cuts, uh, resulting in lack of spare capacity. But secondly, also just in time and um, globalization and in particular the enormous expansion in air travel resulting in um, business models which are inconsistent with operating quarantine. Yeah. Because quarantine has been, uh, since the late Middle Ages, quarantine in travel, quarantine closing down travel at an early stage has been understood to be the fundamental way to deal with epidemics. And um, that uh, the, the, the reluctance of governments to actually shut down international air travel as of uh, January, February um, uh, at a very early stage is, is, is seems to me key. Um, I guess that the, the other issue which is posed by this, you, you talked about debt. It seems to me at the end of the day, when you get to a, a real economic crunch, it, 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 the losses have to either fall on creditor interests or they either have to fall on creditor interests in the form of a, a write down or they have to fall on creditor interests in the form of war and bombs dropping and then generalized state defaults on at least one side of the outcome of the war or both in fact because post 1945 uh, it's the massive debt defaults which sets free the Part of is part of what sets free the development post 1945. Um, 
and th th then that thing somehow we're going to have the 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 world is going to have to confront uh the most of this debt is going to have to be defaulted an awful lot of the debt which has been incurred since the middle 1990s is going to have to be defaulted one way or another and if it isn't defaulted by uh some sort of managed write down it's going to have to be defaulted in the form of war um my second issue I, just my Alan, method of the transitional program. The problem with the method of the transitional program was always that it failed to confront the issue of uh, the state, that it was an attempt to um, uh, e e e um, get around, um, pose the Eco economic issues, but not, to, uh, but but then to think that the self-mobilization of the working class around the economic issues would in itself create Soviets, which in itself would pose the question of the state. And the paradox of that is that Trotsky understood perfectly well, and both in Lessons of October and in his work on the Spanish Revolution, that that wasn't true. It doesn't matter how many bloody Soviets you've got, you can have Reiter all over the country in complete control of the economy, as was the case in Germany and Austria in 1918-19. Um, the Austrians, uh, Otto Bauer says, the councils were in control of all the factories and production. Then they said to us, come and give us a plan. They came to the social democracy and said, take power and give us a plan because we can't carry on production without coordination. Mm -hmm. But because they were still looking to the social democracy and the social democracy's view was that it was uh, unrealistic to take power in Austria because the Italian army would come in and overrun them. Uh, because the social democracy was thinking in terms of one country, uh, the uh, and it's important to be clear because these guys are, are much way to the left of uh, uh, the Austrians are way to the left of um, the majority SPD. Yeah. But because they're thinking in terms of one country and they aren't, and they're thinking in terms of creating a um, rule of law state with an independent presidency and uh, independent judiciary and all of that stuff. Yeah. The fact that there are councils doesn't solve the problem of power. You have to address the question of power. You have to address the question of the, this constitution. And the point which, Michael, you've made in the, your discussion, this, this constitution is paralyzed. This international capitalism is doing nothing about, as you said, nothing about everything which is identified as a problem. It's incapable of acting. Mm -hmm. It's this constitution which you have to get uh, the willingness to actually overthrow the constitution and then uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, then the question is posed of, of planning and winding stuff down and reorganizing the society and so on and so forth. But um, the method of the transitional program, which tries to dodge the issue of the constitution, uh, leaves the labor bureaucracy in power and in consequence you get uh, just a period of leftism and then the restoration of the old order that's it okay um i hope that was useful mike, mike mcnair and having too many speakers for you mike it helps helps them all to answer each other which i think is beginning to happen over to you michael roberts for uh, 10 minutes or so well, yes, it's a lot of uh, points made by a lot of comrades, very good ones, complicated ones too. I'm not sure I'm probably going to miss some and not answer them properly, but I'll do the best I can. The first thing is on the question of the um, uh, growth of the pandemics. Um, it's been asked, well, how, what's the connection here between agro farming and not? And uh, I think uh, the point was made that uh, Mike made that, um, uh, maybe there's always been pandemics. Uh, perhaps the biggest one we can remember in the recent period, well, of course, in medieval times, the Black Death, uh, various other ones which wiped out, in the case of Europe, between a third and a half of the population. Um, the Spanish flu ap uh, epidemic or uh, pandemic at the end of the First World War, which uh, also wiped out way more than. Uh, uh, COVID has done so far, 
uh, because, and both of these are the result of two things, I think. Uh, yes, as you say, the connection between human beings and animals, as far as we can tell, that's how both of these uh, pandemics uh, spread into human beings, but also the movement of human beings. That's the fundamental point. And in the case, for example, of the, of, uh, the Black Death, as Mike was saying, it came from the East through trade and boats and so on. And that's why the Venetians, for example, introduced the quarantining in order to, they recognized after a period of time that if you quarantine people for a sufficient length of time, it reduces the spread of the infection. That's where we get the word from. And that, that also applies to the Spanish pandemic that would have been possible to control the, the flu better, uh, the Spanish flu, if there'd been any quarantine. But as we now know, there was nothing done because it was really driven by military movements, uh, particularly the uh, Allied forces spreading, and there was a massive second uh, spread throughout the United States, no control whatsoever, and it was completely hidden uh, by the government uh, because it took place because it was uh, against the interest of recognizing it being done uh, by the military. Um, the modern pandemics have the same phenomenon, but the difference, of course, we would expect with better health systems better understanding of the nature of these pandemics, that there would have been better control. And you'd have to say that at least containment this time, uh, however badly done, uh, has avoided the absolute disaster of something like 50 or 70 million deaths, which likely would have uh, happened uh, given the level of uh, the death rate of this particular pandemic. But clearly um, what we're seeing is the connection between human beings and animals and the way in which those pathogens are being transferred is taking place. So, that in the modern period, because of the modern rapacious expansion of uh, capitalist production throughout the globe to all parts, and as uh, comrades have said, the tremendous increase in the speed of travel and communications, which means that these things can spread quickly across the, across the world. Uh, there's an author called Rob Wallace, who's done a book called uh, Big farming and big flu, which I recommend you to read to see how you can see the connection between uh, these uh, viruses uh, and their uh, transfer into human beings. I think this uh, offers us a better understanding of how that's connected to the whole process of, of environmental destruction, of the climate change pro uh, disaster, which has happened as a result of uncontrolled industrialization and so on. And I mean, how are we gonna deal with climate change and these other things, unless we deal with the causes of them, and the causes are the complete uncontrolled expansion of fossil fuel production, of timber uh, and logging, of mineral exploitation and so on, all these areas, and who, um, who is doing this? It's the big multinational companies, and they are deciding how, where to expand, how to expand, and how to avoid any uh, control over this. Governments seem to, uh, at a national level, are either unwilling or unable to do anything about it. Until we have complete public ownership and control of the fossil fuel companies so that we can begin to phase out fossil fuel production and replace it with alternative forms of energy and with state investment and planning on an international scale to do that, we are not going to crack the climate change issue and global warming. That's the key, it seems to me, uh, to understanding that. So all these other measures, the so-called carbon capture, of, uh, consumers recycling and all these pathetic me measures are not going to have any effect in controlling the uh, global warming uh, and climate change unless we take drastic action and take control of the major sectors of the economy which are creating carbon emissions and uh, destroying the uh, environment and nature without any control and leading to these expansion of these uh, uh, pandemics and the speed as we seen across across the board as a result. A uh, point was made about well what are we learning during the pandemic? Well we're learning that when people are at home uh, and home working that clearly this is a new area which is going to develop after the pandemic. That people are going to be a lot more people are going to be not, a lot of low pay essential work can't be done from home working but there's still going to be an increase in home working and this area means in two things, it raised the question of mental labor, that um, what I meant by mental labor and what we mean by mental labor, I, in, my term, in my view and value theory is that mental labor is just as much uh, 
the value creating as manual labor or the production of things by people, the production of ideas and sort of communicating those across in order for people to, uh, other people to expand the economy. Information, in other words, is just as much value created. And it's also just as much exploited as well. So that people at home will work longer hours maybe, uh, so they're actually providing extra value to their employers. I know that a lot of people at home at the moment are paying for their own electricity, their own broadband and so on, all the rest of it, uh, and they're not getting any uh, compensation from their employers at the moment. And if they're on furlough and all the rest of it, they're expected to carry on doing that, or even if they're being paid. Uh, big companies are closing down their physical uh, assets, their offices and so on, are planning to close them down permanently, and they're saving quite a bit of money in that direction. So we're going to see the role of mental labour is clearly going to be far more important. That's why we've seen a dramatic increase in the profits of tech companies. How did tech come, why are they making so much money and nobody else? Uh, that was asked. Well, if we look at the nature of the tech companies, we can see that what they're providing is a massive social media and general media communication, which can be uh, made profitable through advertising and through other methods by which the people who are uh, paying money to these social media companies in order to spread their wares, they can make a huge uh, a profit from that. Uh, also providing consumer products directly into the house. Amazon is making $10,000 a second um, as a result of the fact that it's now delivering millions and millions and billions of products every day uh, to everybody around the world, and particularly the advanced economies, where previously we would go to shops and do all that sort of thing. So the, the shopping environment, retail shopping environment, is being killed by online delivery services like Amazon. And then that also applies to online entertainment. You know, cinema is disappearing, even TV broadcasting is disappearing under the uh, growth of uh, tech companies like Netflix and so on. So th there's a change in the structure of uh, the most fast growing parts of the, of the capitalist economy at the, ex uh, at the expense of the slow growing parts. Uh, and a point made was that, um, that we, this creative destruction that uh, I talked about has two aspects to it. First of all, it would mean that if there is creative destruction, it's gonna take place in the weaker, slower moving, less important uh, sectors of the economy to be replaced by these other sectors. So there could be an increase in concentration of the tech companies because they're the, they're the leaders, they're the gainers at the moment, for the moment anyway, until some other new technology comes along which perhaps uh, threatens their uh, dominance, but at the moment they're kings and this pandemic is actually increasing their strength and concentration in the major sectors of the advanced economies at least. And it's so raising, as we know, the major battle that's going to take place on a geopolitical level between China and the US, because China now threatens the US not just on its trade share, but also on its technology share and its threat to the US's hegemony in terms of those most important aspects, at least of the economic basis of US imperialism. So over the next 10 to 20 years, this is the major geopolitical struggle over which of the profit-making sectors of the world economy will be under the control of the United States and its allies or under the or increasingly being lost uh, to the Chinese uh, economy. And that is why we're having this battle which could lead uh, to the most serious developments and intensified uh, rivalry and even war maybe uh, down the road. Uh, I was asked why we didn't have a, why I thought we didn't have a recession despite my predictions. And I think one of the reasons has been was partly mentioned by Mike was that we've had since the period of the Great Recession, a massive injection of credit and uh, quantitative easing support from the central banks, a huge increase in both public and uh, private debt, which has bolstered up all these sectors of the economy which normally would have been crushed uh, by the recession. They've been able to stagger on, the zombies and so on. And this has meant on the one hand that we haven't had a slump uh, in, in the global economy, but we have on the other hand, had a really low level of growth and investment and profitability. So it's been dragged out uh, to a crawl. We had a crawling world economy rather than just a collapsing one, restoring or revitalized Marxist, Marxist style by uh, a rise in profitability. 
And that, so we've crawled along at this level. This cannot go on indefinitely. There has to be a cleansing, as uh, was pointed out. It cannot go on. The capitalism cannot go on, otherwise it just grinds to a, 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 a permanently low level, which would mean eventually the intensification of, of a class conflict, because it's not going to meet the needs of employment, incomes, and so on. It already hasn't been. We now know that the, the generation that's gone to work in the last 10 years for the first time uh, have the prospect of having much less income over their life cycle than my generation did uh, when we went to work back at the, uh, the period of the golden age, uh, because profitability is lower, investment is lower, income generation is lower, decent jobs, decently trained jobs that pay well, that's much lower, we have a much higher level of precarious employment in advanced economies, let alone the fact that 50 to 60 percent of developing economies have informal employment, they're just casual, paid in cash basis, or they don't really have any structure, training, sick pay, anything uh, to, to support them uh, for a career. That's a word in, in most, uh, for most workers in the developing economy, economies, it's a meaningless term, uh, and increasingly a meaningless term also now in the advanced economies. All these, I think, are the products of the fact that we haven't had a slump. Uh, my argument would be if we had a major slump and it cleansed out the zombie companies, it might create conditions for a revival of capitalism for a period of time, but it's increasingly difficult for capitalism to develop the productive forces and expand uh, because of the level of profitability, even if it rises a bit, as you can see historically, is low. We're entering a period in the 21st century where capitalism is nowhere near as healthy as it was in the uh, halfway through the 20th century or even in periods before that. This is a serious, it's a long-term issue for the transition of capitalism into another post-capitalist society, socialism, or even worse, perhaps we'll turn to something worse of a barbaric uh, nature. We haven't reached that point uh, yet. Uh, I suppose the other points that I would like to make are on the question of the transitional program, or what demands should the labour movement be doing? What's the problem? What do we face as we come out of this pandemic? What we face, as far as I'm concerned, for most workers, is do we have our jobs when we get back? If we get back to work, will there be our jobs still be there? Will they get the same wages and conditions? If we take the UK case of British Airways, we can now see this major British company, which all should be publicly owned, not run by these uh, profit making. Uh, creeps from Spain and God knows where, uh, these, these are completely decimating the employment prospects of, of BA workers by making them apply for their contracts again, sacking quite a large numbers of them and making the others come back at way, way lower levels of working conditions and wages. That's the prospect for the whole layers of workers, not only in Britain, but in the US and, and other countries. Germany has uh, kept people on the payroll, made it a pain for companies to keep them on the payroll, but already Germany is operating a dual labour system where whole swathes of workers are on lower wages but doing similar jobs to those more uh, who have been longer standing or are more, are more slightly skilled in those terms. They have a dual labour market in Germany and in Spain it's similar. And now the UK and the US are operating are going to be operating on that same basis. So one basic demand is that we must demand the same rights, jobs and conditions and wages that workers had before. That's a defensive struggle because it's going to be employers applying the offensive to destroy that. But the offensive struggle, in my view, is on the front of public health and public services. I find it difficult to see how any government is going to be able to defend the idea of cutting public health services uh, after this pandemic or other public services. They will be attempting to do that, but it's they are going to get a, a massive campaign, it seems to me, across the board to ensure that we don't have a pandemic again when public and with public health systems unable to, to uh, withstand and absorb it. Uh, and that, that means that there's been plenty of surveys that show the more a private uh, health service uh, is privatized, the less effective it has been in defending people's health during this pandemic. And that the efforts now have got to be made to fight on those lines, and I think that had uh, a lot of support in labor movements around the world for a single care health system. On the question of uh, 
universal basic income, which is also another demand that's being suggested, that we should be advocating that. I've not been a great fan of that because I think the jobs should be, the aim should be for full employment, jobs for all, at decent wages and hours, plus decent public services. And what that means in that second part is that what we really should be fighting for is an extension of all kinds of uh, social needs that people have into the public sector where they're delivered at the point of use for free. So not just health, not just education, but transport, communications, even sectors of goods provision uh, could be provided free at the point of use. And that universal basic services seems a much more effective way to help people on the social. It also raises the collectivized nature uh, of the economy and what we move, must move and combine towards public ownership and control of the key essential parts of an economy if, you look, if we're going to progress. Yes, it can't be done only in one country, uh, uh, but it, you have to start there to move towards a society where the collective uh, needs of people are met by the collective production and cooperation of people rather than through the private sector for private profit. Okay, thank you, Michael. And uh, we've got a, a nice little list of, speak, of uh, speakers coming. Sarah first. And uh, I uh, make no apology for doing political chairing. It's not first come, first served. It's a question of uh, making sure that points of view get heard. And so uh, Alan Gibson will come in after Sarah for a second bite. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so just to start off on something um, slightly irrelevant, I guess, on the question of how stats are accounted in terms of COVID, because obviously you've seen places that have dealt with it more responsibly have um, generally lower uh, infections and death rates, places like the USA and, um, uh, and, and so on, who have, um, who have dealt with it really irresponsibly have had obviously much, much higher rates. Um, but also, there, 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 as Mike pointed out, there are um, discrepancies in how these things are counted. And I listened to something on, uh, more or less, on Radio 4 the other day uh, that talked about how the difference in the devolved nations within the UK count them. For example, in Scotland, which does have, uh, you know, a much lower uh, death rate and infection rate. But if you've had COVID symptoms, um, it only counts your death of COVID if you die within, I think, 21 days or 28 days. Uh, of, of the symptoms being recorded, whereas if you have it in England, if you have COVID symptoms in England uh, and you die three months later because you're hit by a bus, it still counts in the COVID death score. So um, while that doesn't make a massive uh, difference, it is quite an interesting little aside. Um, yeah, uh, we, uh, a group of us, read some of the Rob Wallace uh, stuff, which was very interesting, actually. Uh, and I think that it, it does suggest that there is a strong link between um, mass agriculture um, and, and, and conditions within that and, and the spread of, of different uh, diseases uh, and, and how these viruses and things can cross species uh, and so on. So, I mean, it's an interesting, an interesting bit. And I think that, you know, uh, I think as things happen on a mass scale, um, you know, then it becomes um, much easier for that, for that to happen. Um, in terms of the, uh, the impending um, sort of environmental catastrophe, I mean, I, I kind of share Alan's fears, really, uh, you know, um, and it's not something, as, as comrades have said, that can be dealt with uh, by sort of responsible individuals or even, you know, it can be mitigated to an extent by pressure uh, it can, uh, within capitalism, it can be mitigated to an extent by uh, technology and science finding environmental solutions, but fundamentally it cannot be um, reversed or addressed in the way it needs to be uh, in the current system. Um, so, you know, while people are, are all very well sort of reducing their plastics and, um, you know, sort of using, not using single cups, which obviously everybody's doing again now because um, of, of the virus, um, you know, that, that's not going to, to make a difference. It's, it's going to end home, it's like giving a pound to a homeless person on the street, it's not going to end homelessness. Um, so, um, you know, but, you know, and also you'll see a rise in, while well, you'll see a drop in air travel, uh, particularly uh, for leisure uh, and to an extent for business, um, you will, you've also seen an increase uh, in people using private vehicles because, you know, people don't want to get on packed public transport 
Um, so, you know, I've been working throughout the pandemic as a key worker um, and I've been cycling across London and you noticed it months ago being really quiet and the air, be, air quality being better and now it, the streets are gridlocked and the air quality is appalling um, and, you know, summer doesn't help with, with that as well, but, uh, but you, you know, people understandably aren't uh, even uh, carpooling, never mind getting on public transport and cycling is dangerous. Um, so, and yeah, a lot of people got into this idea, oh, isn't it you know, silver linings of, of COVID, we get to spend more time with family, we get to, you know, sort of be, be more mindful, we get to commune more with nature. Well, there's the other side of that as well, which is, uh, you know, sort of poor mental health. Um, if you are trying to work from home, especially if you're a single parent, dealing with childcare, you've, the schools are, are shut to all but key workers and vulnerable groups. Um, and you know, sort of, I've been in so many meetings online where people have got kids crawling all over them, and they can't focus, they can't concentrate, they can't give a presentation, and that's going to uh, adversely affect women uh, more than men. Um, so, and I, I'm not entirely convinced that people working longer hours at home, um, I think, because of other pressures such as caring for people, uh, childcare, and so on, having to, if even with their two parents, having to split the time where you're, one is looking after the child and the other one is is working um, and also it's just less as a less disciplined um, way of working and you know uh, for most people you say well I'll just go and have a coffee well I'll just go and do this uh, and you're not clocking in the same hours that you would do in the office or yeah. in, the, in the workplace um, and you know uh, I've noticed that uh, particularly with a lot of people that uh, I, I manage and you know understandably so um, then there's the question which you touched upon about, um, you know, sort of obviously the tech companies are likely to do well out of this because people are shopping online increasingly for safety uh, and also people are consuming more entertainment online because they're at home more, uh, particularly in the early stages of lockdown where people weren't leaving the house. So you can see Netflix subscriptions and, and online streaming services, although I th don't think Netflix actually made a big profit in the last quarter from what I read somewhere, incidentally. Um, yeah, often will save money on rent, uh, but then uh, and you know um, potentially on electricity and, and you know the physical building spaces cleaning and so on uh, if they're not open uh, are they you know more people work from home and increasingly people will be working from home until January um, you know uh, so you can you can see that they would save money but to what extent is that offset against people not being as productive and then there's a the question of um, footfall uh, not just because people are shopping online but because people aren't going to get a prep sandwich and a coffee at lunchtime uh, aren't coming in, in and out of the station shops and the cafes nearby and, and the news agent uh, you know local homeless guy has been down at, um, at the new cross station uh, ended up um, sort of saying I've, I've, I've changed my position to Sains outside Sainsbury's now because there's just no footfall at the station uh, <laughs> so he's not making any money <laughs> so you know so so there's all of these sort of small businesses and big chains um, who again employ precarious workers and you know 18 to 25 year olds who will be hit massively financially have no savings have no property Sarah, uh, you know in, please Sarah can you yes I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm winding up now this is my last point okay, okay. Um, and the the impact that we're going to have on future generations um, in terms of we've seen the exam results fiasco uh, we'll see you know sort of what's happening with uh, university degrees and so on and kids that have not been in school for now six months will lose, will lose out on learning so again the, the long-term impacts on sort of skills and education uh, how that then affects the economy uh, is something that's worth considering as well. Yeah sorry to interrupt um, uh, I've got Alan Gibson for a second bite but that's uh, an unusual thing um, and uh, but we, I do want to hear what you say, particularly because the uh, uh, transitional things raised. I think that maybe whatever. Uh, keep it fairly short, okay? Um, yeah, just briefly on the um, threat of more pandemics being just being green ideology. I'd refer Mike, as others have done, to the work of Rob Wallace. Um, yeah. What would you, what is being talked about here is a particular kind of pandemic. Um, these transmission of uh, animal viruses which are jumping from species so in the last decade or, decade or so we've had the h1n1 or swine flu virus the sars virus mers virus covid is in the same uh, bracket and these uh, as robert wallace points out are uh, encouraged greatly by um, monoculture industrial farming methods of capitalist and agriculture however it is true as you say that uh, a major factor as well are uh, the social relations uh, under capitalism and the uh, 
problems that capitalism has because of, of implementing uh, the necessary quarantine measures because of the need for profits. Uh, but I to just um, write that off as just green ideology is not uh, accurate, I don't think. So the question of the transitional program, um, I don't think the transitional program and the group, political group I uh, support, the Bolshevik tendency certainly doesn't see um, the when you raise the transitional program that it should uh, not confront, fail to confront the question of the state, that it um, shouldn't address the question of power. The question of power is integral to the method of the, the transitional program. Um, it's absolutely central to it. Of course, there is a problem that, and this is maybe something that your influence might from your political past, is that most of the groups that call themselves Trotskyists uh, avoid, do indeed avoid that question of power and leave the bridge um, hanging over the river and do not go to the question of power. That's true. However, this is not just a problem for those of us who um, stand uh, in the tradition of the transitional program and have that problem because most groups who also say that don't actually apply that methodology and don't inc include the question of power. But it's also true for groups like the CPGB who stand in the um, tradition of the minimum maximum program. And if to anything, if anything, that's actually a greater problem for uh, groups who stand in that tradition because of the way that the minimum maximum program has in practical politics uh, for nearly the last hundred years been applied. Um, but still, whatever you call it, and maybe we need to come up with a new term because the traditional program and minimum maximum program approaches have been so sullied by the actual reformist politics of the outright left reformist and centrist groups. But still, um, I think that Michael Roberts makes a very good point that because of the how capitalism is going to respond, we know how capitalism is going to respond. We saw it only a decade again, and they don't know, they have no other way to respond. The question of jobs, the questions of public health, also the question of housing, as John Smithy, I think, had asked a question at the beginning. That's um, a major issue, particularly in the United States, and it's an increasing issue here in Ireland, where I live. Um, but that those are going to be the, I think, the issues which um, anybody trying to present a program um, has to uh, relate to um, as the immediate uh, hooks which you're going to engage with the working class uh, responding in a more or less spontaneous way. However, the perspective of this revolutionary program, whatever you want to call it, I mean, uh, John Riddell talked about it as this transitional-ish um, being talked about in the 1920s when the United Front um, uh, tactic was being developed. Um, w there will be a need to link those immediate issues which are coming out of the uh, capitalist attacks uh, on our class uh, in the, their response to the recession slash depression which is coming. Um, and that, those wider issues have to include the effects of ecological collapse. Um, and from that, they have to point to the question of power. So I'm quite prepared to call it something else um, if we can come up with a new phrase rather than traditional program or minimum maximum program, whatever it is, but it has to be something which engages with the uh, immediate um, problems faced by the working class, but points to the wider issues and integrates those in coherently into a program which poses the question of power. Um, it's not just, as Mike says, it's not just enough to call for Soviets. It's, you've got to get across the idea in some way, whether or not you use this particular phrase, but the idea of all power to the Soviets. Finish. Thank you, Alan. That's very helpful. Um, Yasmin, and then Jim Modi and Geraldine. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about what I would consider to be right now um, the worst problem in terms of the competition between China and the US. I think one thing that COVID has done is actually accentuated the uh, problems of mainly the Anglo-Saxon economies, mm -hmm. uh, US and UK, um, especially US. I mean, UK, yes, it's a terrible situation, but in some ways, it's less important, the US. And the questioning 
uh, rightly the question of the future of the hegemon power. I think we are still a long way from it. But what I wanted to ask you was your understanding of the share of global economy. I hear 23% for US. What would you say is China's share of um, global economy? In the same um, uh, trend, um, we know that quite a lot of the foreign exchange reserves of China are actually in dollars. What I would be interested to know is this interdependence of China on the US economy, how will it affect the coming years? Uh, because clearly <laughs> the two competing powers that will go in a form of Cold War, in a form of trade war, have many interdependencies. In the same respect, and I think you have written about this, but I'm, I couldn't remember it, I couldn't find it when I was looking for it. As you know, China is the first country probably, for one of the first major economies that is trying now to use the electronic an electronic currency ER, uh, the ERMB as they call it and it is important because it's one of the ways it's uh, trying to bypass for example US sanctions against Iran or US sanctions against other countries um, how viable is this will it get anywhere um, and on debts the question of debts are important. So on the one hand, we have debts by many third world countries uh, to the IMF, to the World Bank and so on. Now the US is claiming that China's Silk Road is a China debt policy. And they are right in that China is uh, making major investments in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East. And uh, as a result of this taking um, uh, if you like, um, reserves of those countries as collateral for its for the debt it's giving. How, how would that happen as the Chinese economy itself is facing quite a serious crisis? Um, just two very short points. I think just in time affected the um, uh, computing industry more than almost anybody else. And it came as a surprise, but given that production of most um, computers, including um, servers, high performance computers and so on, is uh, in China. Uh, the first few months of COVID affected the production of major computing um, systems and actually delayed that. And one last point, automation. I don't think it's just that capitalism will delay. It's just that we are, very, we are still a very long way. I think people overestimate what is happening with automation. It's very easy to read something and assume that we are at a stage of doing away with humans. Um, I've spoken about this before. I don't want to bore people, but it's just not, we are nowhere near it. That's it. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, Jim Moody now. Jim, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, nice I'm really pleased to uh, hear Michael's introduction and, of course, contributions throughout uh, and uh, the blogs that he sends out regularly. I'm a subscriber and a, a fan, you could say. Um, but the, the important thing for me is what shows at the moment various forms of the corruption of capitalism. The fact that can we depend upon the statistics, for example, comes to my mind. I mean, I take the example of India, the government there, fascists included, um, have in the past few months and recent years tried to falsify production figures uh, and, 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 and everything else connected with the economy uh, and also uh, managed to snaffle a lot of uh, individual people's individual savings by demonetizing part of the currency. And they've also got a situation where only about a third of deaths are ever recorded in, in India. So clearly that's got a big skewing effect on what we see in relation to the way COVID-19 might affect production uh, and the economy there in that relation. 
the human relation. Uh, similarly, you've got a, a, a problem with China's lack of frankness about the beginning of the infection uh, and subsequently. Uh, and the other example is the, so obvious, Trump's uh, attitude to massaging statistics. Um, well, we're getting some poor percentages, so let's top, stop testing. Um, so, you know, all of the things, and these are just like touching on it, the veracity of the statistics in relation to the, the World Bank and the others uh, that uh, Michael's quoted uh, in, the, in, the very, uh, in the very important um, factors in the, in the introduction he made, it makes me wonder whether we're really looking at an optimistic portrayal by the, the World Bank and so on. Um, and therefore the situation, as plenty of other commentators have suggested, are much, much worse. I see too that in, uh, another aspect of this corruption of capitalism at the moment is the new Malthusianism of the, the Cummings uh, school of reactionaries. Yeah. It, just, it just represents another desperation of, of capitalism and its ideologues to protect profit no matter what the human cost. The unproductive humans, in capitalist terms, um, we can well do without under this uh, ideology. The, the fact that half the deaths in the UK, I think it was reported in the Financial Times yesterday, the day before, are of disabled people. Yeah. And obviously, as we know, the, the, the uh, biggest cohort uh, of deaths are amongst the elderly, um, which uh, for people like me with the gray hair, start to become, it becomes an important issue personally. But um, it's, I think, as Michael said, there's a, there's a question for these people of letting the thing rip of creative destruction. Because I think, I don't know who, who it might have been, Michael himself, in one of the blogs, but somebody recently I've read was talking about the way, uh, or it might have been Mike McNair, I can't remember, but was talking about the way that there will be more housing available if, if sufficient elderly people die and they're, um, they're uh, those who are actually going to get the an inheritance, either flog it off or sent, sent to, into the rental market and so on. Um, this will be a bonus for the economy. Uh, and no doubt others can think of other examples of how this um, anti-human attitude could produce benefits for capitalism. It does show, doesn't it? And I think it shows from millions of people who haven't been thinking maybe as politically as the rest of us here, that capitalism cares for profit, not people. You know, sometimes the simplicity of slogans is, is just basically too simple. But in relation to getting people to grasp hold of these things, that drugs companies want to sell to the rich, they couldn't care a monkeys about uh, the rest of us, basically, whatever percentage that is. So I think it's fake this, fake that, and the other, <laughs> where, uh, coming back to the statistical question, where do we, where do we look for these, uh, this veracity? And um, obviously, um, despite the fact that it's a, it's a very pessimistic outlook, if capitalism continues, clearly we then have to get the mass of people behind this question and traditionally explain to them that it's been the communists, the socialists in the working class movement who have consistently put forward this question uh, and being the most advanced environmentalists. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Nice to see you after all this time. Um, and Geraldine. Oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, <coughs> Jim, um, it saves on pensions as well, if we all die. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, my question is to do with a remark um, Robert made. Thank you all for your contributions. Very interesting and um, an interesting talk. Uh, it's to do with the division between mental and manual labor. Yeah. And I think uh, my question is what in economic and political circles are people trying to do to overcome this division. It's happening especially in education. The British education system is structured very strongly on a division between academics and the rest, mental and manual labour. 
And the Education Authority in London, the Greater London Education Authority, had, until the early 1980s, a deliberate policy of ensuring that only 20% of children sat A-levels and the other 80% went out and found jobs or unemployment. So it's a, a deeply embedded in the system, but I think it's all very well for people in education, like myself I was, um, to talk about it amongst themselves. It needs to be a much wider question. So I'm just wondering, um, well especially with uh, the young people receiving A-level and about to receive GCSE results, it's scandalous. Yeah. The universities and the government could, do, could solve the problem overnight by just saying, okay, we're going to give everyone we've offered a place. And it's not going to kill them. It's just going to need a bit of money. But um, anyway, I'm not going to go down that track. I think it's pretty apparent. So I just wonder is, is to what degree are people concerned about this division? Because until it's broken, we're not going to be able to progress very far in consciousness of individuals, uh, in my view, I think will not rise very far because you have to make the connection between the theories and ideas and ideology and your position at work to be able to, you can't just experience it economically or politically, they have to be brought together. So until people can have a fairly reasonable education and be encouraged to think in every aspect and communicate in every form, we've got a long way to go, I reckon. Anyway, thank you. I'd be very grateful to know if you've got any solutions. Thanks, uh, Geraldine. Mike, now you're putting questions into the to panellists rather than the public, rather than all uh, attendees, just pointing it out in case you want to speak to all of us. Um, I've got no other speakers at the moment, um, and uh, Michael, you've got plenty to do. We've got 20 minutes left, so there is a possibility of another bite of the cherry, but uh, maybe that's maybe that's good enough. Um, I'm looking at Jack there. Are you trying to speak, Jack? Jack's saying he would like to speak. Shall I bring him in first? Yeah. Okay, go on. Okay, Jack Conrad. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I was just going to say something very, very, very quick. Uh, and that is, um, you know, uh, Michael, you, you talked about, um, uh, you know, um, post-COVID, maybe COVID is a sort of permanent feature, light flu is uh, um, since whenever. <laughs> well, seriously, you know, can they actually eliminate it? Yeah. Will the vaccine work? Will it be, uh, you know, all these, will it, will it mutate? So all, all of these questions sort of remain. And um, the, the point I was going to make, you mentioned barbarism. And um, looking around the planet, um, you know, looking at Trump, looking at, you know, the, the, the global hegemon and what's going on there and the sort of craziness um, of it, looking at Britain with the National Health Service, no matter how, you know, uh, underfunded, yeah. And yet there's Britain at the top of the league table, um, let alone when you start then to go to India, um, Africa, and what we would expect to happen over the next year or two, your economy um, either flatlining um, or going down, um, looking at the, you know, I don't want to go on and on, but looking at the um, um, uh, likelihood uh, of um, dramatic uh, uh, climate change, i.e. you actually reach a tipping point, aren't we uh, already in barbarism? And in that yeah. sense, seriously, yeah. and in that sense, you know, if we look at previous periods in the history of capitalism, at least we had a realistic possibility, given the existence of high level of socialist consciousness, a high level of um, socialist organization, we had some sort of prospect of taking over. 
So in terms of Trotsky's transitional program, he's looking at mass communist parties, mass socialist parties. He knows he's weak, but the working class is potentially strong. We can't say that today. So uh, in terms of comrades saying that your introduction was gloomy, I'm sort of adding, <laughs> adding to the gloom, if you see the point. That was all. Okay. Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, and uh, over to you, Michael, to uh, sum up, answer all the points completely, okay? Yeah, without, without any missing any whatsoever. Um, well, let me just deal with the, the, the second round, as it were. Uh, Yasmin's point about the growing rivalry between uh, China and the US is a really big key question that we've got to uh, put on the agenda regularly to understand what's going on in China, what's going on uh, globally, and the relation between the two. Uh, on the actual facts, uh, depends on how you measure GDP. If you measure it in market dollars, which I think is the best way to do so, rather than the IMS measure of purchasing power parity, which I won't go into the difference, but basically uh, China's uh, share of the world GDP is around about 12 or 13% now compared to the US's at 20%. But if you think about it, just, just less, well, less than 20 years ago, China's is only 3%. So it shows you the dramatic rise in China in the relative strength if you're measuring in terms of GDP. And of course, in other areas, in terms of manufacturing production, they are the largest in the world. And in terms of trade, export uh, as an export uh, country, they're one of the largest, if not the largest in the world, um, at least in goods. Uh, so there, there's been a dramatic change there. And there's also an expansion on all sorts of other levels, in particular technology, where from just being, uh, as it were, copying or taking foreign technology at the beginning of the great uh, rise of uh, Chinese industrial and technical production, uh, they've uh, moved on to actually developing their own technologies. And of course, they know, we now know they're leaders in 5G and in other areas uh, which uh, threaten the uh, hegemony of uh, the US uh, imperialism in particular. But it is still the case that the US, in my view, is the main hegemonic power and is not really threatened at this stage uh, by China's rise in a general sense, for two reasons. First of all, if you look at it at the per capita GDP, uh, then of course China is way, way still behind US per capita GDP. Something like, at the best, it's 25% uh, of US per capita GDP. There's still a long way to go for China to be considered uh, a prosperous, advanced uh, economy uh, where uh, leaving aside inequalities at the moment, and inequalities in China measured on, at least on the level of income, are pretty high, more or less, uh, not quite as high as the US, but very high. Uh, so that China has got a long way to go on per capita GDP to be considered uh, part of the uh, top economies in per capita terms. Also, uh, leaving aside trade and, and manufacturing production in terms of capital flows and financial strength, of course, uh, the US, the UK and other imperialist countries dominate. And I've done research with uh, Gregelman and Carcady on the, on the nature of imperialism, and China is still a peripheral country in that sense, that there's transfers through trade and capital flows from China to the imperialist countries that continue to dominate. And China hasn't broken out from that uh, trap yet, uh, although it threatens to do so, which is the, the issue which uh, the Americans in particular are concerned about and want to do something about it. They've given up on trying to engage China, as it were, bring them into the World Trade Organization, hoping that they will allow foreign imperialism to take over in China, to privatize the economy. That's failed. The Chinese state hasn't gone along with that. They've taken advantage of the World Trade uh, development without giving any real major concessions to foreign imperialism. They're divided on the question in the Chinese elite about how far they should go on that. But up to now, particularly under Xi, that's not happening. So the, the Americans have now turned to a different strategy. They call it containment, but basically it means an aggressive attempt to curb, strangle and paralyze uh, the Chinese economy and the Chinese state and its expansion, particularly the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a serious uh, uh, development against uh, American influence ar around the world if uh, China continue with that program. So this is gonna be the key question. 
uh, on the geopolitical uh, level for the next 10 or 20 years, and it poses, along with all the other challenges that capitalism faces, serious uh, risks of uh, breakdown or of significant, intense uh, rivalry between the powers around the world. Um, yes, uh, this pandemic, we discussed the question of whether the pandemic is uh, different uh, than previous pandemics. And uh, I know it's always been pointed out in the chat line here that look, there's been lots of serious diseases that are spread around the world. And there's in many cases, capitalism hasn't really con controlled all of them yet. Health systems have allowed them to expand. Uh, so pandemics are just another example of this process. But clearly, as has also been pointed out, they do have a diff these latest viruses have a different uh, origin in a way because of the way they've jumped from uh, pathogens in wildlife through to humans through the industrial farm. So the, the increasing globalization of the world, which is what we mean through trade, capital flows, and industrial development and urbanization, has uh, added to the other diseases that the poorer parts of the world struggle to cope with without the help of, them, of uh, the advanced economies that have added now to the danger hitting the advanced economies. Now we're not talking about uh, mass deaths from uh, malaria and for other diseases which have generally hit the poor countries, but mass deaths in Europe, in North America and elsewhere. This is a phenomenon which uh, clearly we haven't seen since the uh, Spanish flu epi epidemics until the later period of the 20th century with the ones that have been mentioned in SARS and so on. But this is the worst because it's spread so far internationally. And the, and the idea uh, that uh, it has existed amongst the certain sectors of the capitalist class that um, you know, as it only hit, hits the elderly and the sick and the disabled, the vulnerable, the people are the most unproductive in the world. Uh, I'm looking at your faces on this screen and you're looking at mine. And as far as capitalist class is concerned, most of us are totally unproductive now. We've given what we can to increasing the value of capital. Uh, and now we're, we're, we can be happily dispensed with. Um, on the other hand, I would say to the capitalist class, some of us have got experience and skills that still might be useful to them. And when I look at the conservative cabinet or the US administration's cabinet, I wonder, uh, as they're most of the uh, over 65, whether they're also unproductive. And they're certainly more unproductive than the rest of us sitting here. But, Apparently, they're okay, they're to be uh, tested and looked after. But the vast mass of people, ordinary people who are elderly, sick, and disabled, are uh, can be written off Malthusian style so that we can have a more productive capitalist economy in the future. Whether that's true or not, it's certainly a line which uh, has appeared, I can tell you, as somebody who's worked as a city economist in the past for 30 years in the corridors of the boardrooms when this pandemic first started and they realized that it was only mainly hitting these people, that that was an option, that the herd immunity option was there, just let all the young people get it and let the old people die because they don't matter. Uh, but of course that wasn't possible, as I argued at the beginning of my uh, presentation, because it's, uh, it, it would have just overwhelmed public health systems and have created the conditions by which they wouldn't, they wouldn't visibly look shocking and disastrous uh, for uh, governments to uh, allow to happen. So they were forced into the position, uh, particularly as people were making a standby, just not going to work and not, and not doing what the government wants. And they're still not doing, they're still not allowing schools to work, and they're still not returning to work sufficiently, despite the efforts of capitalist governments to try and enforce them. So uh, they were forced into that position, even if they had the policy that they would have liked to have had, which would have been just to let this uh, run riot and see what happens. And, and uh, on the question, I think the other question that springs to mind is on the, um, on the question of mental and manual labor. Increasingly, the distinction between the two is sh sharply disappearing. It also means in a modern capitalist economy, people need, as has been pointed out, uh, a level of skills and education which will enable them to provide uh, useful extra value for capitalism. So mental labor uh, and manual labor, which has always existed, uh, increasingly have to be seen as, as united, it seems to me. And the division that exists between the two uh, is something which in the past for capitalism may wanted, but now is much more difficult to achieve if they wish to uh, get the value creation 
out of uh, working people. This, the, uh, and yet, as you say, the class system is so strong that it drives a sharp division in, against the interests of capital as well as labor uh, between uh, uh, young people in their prospects for uh, work and uh, a, a better life. Uh, one of the staggering things about this unbelievably awful A-level fiasco is the Secretary of Education in the UK uh, issuing a tweet congratulating Eton College on getting the best A-level results ever, while the rest of the uh, uh, schools are taking a hit as a result of this uh, lunatic met, uh, policy adopted by, by the government. Um, but I'll finish on this point, Chair, that um, Jack has raised a pessimistic view, which is undoubtedly realistic in many ways, that uh, we have this capitalism is unable, it seems, to take the productive forces forward properly in any way, even if it comes out of this pandemic. And as, you, as he says, that, that, that the virus is going to be there forever. But even if it comes out and is able to restore some level of re economic recovery, it's going to be weak, it's going to be poor, it's not going to develop productive forces, it's not going to provide the jobs and conditions and uh, quality of life and services that people need uh, on a world scale over the next uh, generation. Uh, clearly, it's weakening in its ability to do even that, uh, and let alone exploit uh, working people in the course of doing that. But I would say, and this is the positive thing, that it's not true that the working class is dead. Uh, class struggle is ended. If you measure it just on an objective figure, the working class has never been bigger in the history of the world, of humanity, and of capitalism. We have three and a half billion people who can be considered working class. They have to work. They go to employment and work. Uh, and th so that is a massive number of working people. Of course, the weight of those working people is not in the so-called advanced economies anymore, uh, where uh, people who work in the, the employment ratios is relatively lower than it is elsewhere, but it's still a massive working class. So maybe the struggles, the, the working class of China is huge, the working class of India is huge, the working class of Brazil is huge. These countries have massive working classes uh, and they are still mainly industrial proletariats as well, not uh, just uh, uh, workers in service industries and tourism, which we see more in, uh, in the advanced economies. I still believe that it is possible over the period of the next generation that we'll also have the opportunity for that class to take action and the class struggle hasn't disappeared. And that the events, not only of the COVID, but of the development economically of capitalism over the next 10 to 15 years will create uh, the conditions where the political struggle and uh, class struggle industry as well as politically uh, can intensify and provide the opportunity uh, if we have uh, been able to link that together with, a, with a, the sort of issues and program that people recognize that they need uh, in order to be linked together, that we can uh, bring about the change in society that all of us, at least in our lifetimes, have been uh, fighting for and struggling for. If not, maybe the next generation. All done, Mike, thank you. That's very useful and uh, uh, an interesting debate, I must say. Um, I see, I, I wish I knew how to get the chat column out because uh, some people want to look at it. Sometimes there's references in there. We'd like to be able to reproduce the chat column and save it. You can copy and save it somehow, I think. If there is a way, uh, it'd be good. It'd be good to know. Maybe one of our people can do it. This can save. Spread it around. Pardon? The host can save the chat. The host can save the chat. Okay. Right. Hope so. Hope the host will save the chat before they leave the meeting in that case. Okay. We've got um, this afternoon, uh, where's it gone? This afternoon... Can uh, I go then, uh, host? Is that okay? Yes, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Time for my lunch. Yes, yeah, you don't need lunch, you've got to go swimming, okay? <laughs> um, well, bye, thanks back very much, everybody, for your contributions and questions. I hope, try my best to answer them, but I probably missed a few. And we want you to come to all the other sessions this week, okay? Enjoy. All right, well, I'll go and have my afternoon nap now, being an old man. So uh, now this afternoon is Daniel Lazar, who's present actually in this meeting, I think.
talking about theorizing the US Constitution. So that should be an interesting stuff uh, with Mark Lewis chairing. Uh, tomorrow morning, I don't know. Tomorrow morning is when Hillel Tiktin can't come because he's got health questions, he's postponed. So maybe somebody can announce what's happening at 10 a.m. Uh, on, no, not tomorrow, I beg your pardon. That's me going up the spout Tuesday morning. We've still got time, of course, but uh, it'd be good to know what the replacement is. I believe there's going to be a replacement uh, session. Uh, Jack, please tell us. Well, um, we've had an, we're sort of having a number of different suggestions. And so um, on our list, um, I have put forward a suggestion that Mike uh, should talk on um, um, the transitional method. And I've also suggested that maybe I could talk on the question of um, black lives, but in the context of uh, the army, the police and the arms question, and we went with that. But then I thought maybe in terms of actually stimulating discussion, I don't know what, I'm not gonna throw it open to this forum and have a vote or anything like that. But I thought in terms of the comrades who are here, maybe it would be a good idea if I did a talk on the foundation of the CPGB and its relevance today, i.e. the question of can we form a party because that's what's been raised in the last session. That's, that's to me, that's a fundamental question. So th this is me thinking about it uh, after making that suggestion. So that's where we are at the moment, Stan. So Hillel is ill and we hope to have him later in the week uh, but that's how things stand at the moment. So they're a little bit in the air, and I have to apologize uh, for that. We haven't finalized, I think. It will take some time to reset up as well, so that's also a consideration. Anyway. Well, that's okay. The important point is that there will be a 10 o'clock Tuesday morning session, and we will announce what it is, okay? Um, as for tomorrow's 10 o'clock, that's Paul Kellerman uh, on Britain's Israel. What does it stand for? Uh, Paul Kellerman, of course, is the author of that interesting book about the long divorce between uh, Labour and uh, Zionism. Um, I can't remember the title, but there it is. So that'll be interesting tomorrow. This afternoon, Daniel Lazar, US Constitution, theorising the US Constitution. See you at 4.30, comrades. Bye-bye.